right, so Troy has given, given you into my hands. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, if you don't know me, you know I'm a bit of a history nerd. If that's a thing, I don't know, maybe it is. But let's just go with that. Um, but I, I love history. And so a lot of places that we go, we end up trying to find some sort of historical thing that happened. So yesterday was just, you know, wonderful. And it really was beautiful out there. But it's, it's one of those things that's both awe-inspiring, terrifying, and extremely sobering. You know, because you read numbers of how many people were killed, wounded, or captured. And on those sides, and it's just, it's staggering. It's hard to even uh, conceptualize that. But uh, at any rate, so today, uh, please open to Matthew 12, or if you want to look in your bulletin, the, the text is also printed there. Um, so continuing with the, with the history bit, I wanted to talk a little bit today about Custer. So this is, and this is something that, uh, while he was at the Battle of Gettysburg, as you may or may not know, he was also in a lot of the campaigns uh, that took place here in the valley. So he's not a name that's unknown to several locations. He, made his way around the Civil War, and then after the Civil War, uh, went out west and participated in a lot of the uh, Indian American Wars that, that happened out there. So, Custer's last stand. Uh, there's, you know, lots of images, of course, no photographs that, that have come from that incident. The, the Indians actually called it the Battle of the Greasy Grass. That was, that was the area that they called it. So, we call it Custer's last stand. They, they had a different name for it. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting story, tragic in, in many regards. Uh, and it's interesting because we have, well, we don't have too many first-hand accounts, as you may or may not know. But we, um, the first-hand accounts that we do have are actually from the Native Americans. I have a book at home uh, that's written by a, a man named Black Elk, and it's really just a one big interview from him. He was at a lot of the major incidents in the uh, American Indian Wars. So, you know, like Custer's Last Stand, uh, Wounded Knee, and, and many others that are significant. But anyway, it's interesting to read his account of, of what happened. It's, it's both disturbing and, and interesting from a historical perspective. But what, the reason I bring this up, you know, and there's Custer in the middle, though, though actually he did have long hair. In fact, his, the name the Indians referred to him was uh, Pahunska, which meant long hair. That was his identifying mark. Um, and so, you know, here he is with his, with his men, and, you know, they're making their last stand. As, as you know, they, they did not survive. Uh, but what led up to that is really what makes this tragic, because there was bad reconnaissance. You know, they said, oh, there's about 800, there's about 800 uh, Indians out there that you have to deal with. Well, there were 800 that had left the reservation, uh, gone to do their own thing. So they said, okay, that's how many people are out there. Not realizing that in the weeks prior to this, there were thousands more that followed them. So what they thought were 800 were actually more like 2,000. There was also miscommunication and, and some glory grabbing. Um, you know, Custer was known to be a, a dandy. You know, he, that's why he wore the long hair and he, he did the outfit and he had it, you know, he had it going on. Uh, so there was a there was a bit of, of glory grabbing going on, I, I believe. And so he pressed on. Instead of waiting for the reinforcements to arrive, he said, we've got this. In fact, I think he's quoted as saying, uh, there's nothing that, that can come our way that the 7th Cavalry can't handle. Not realizing just how overwhelming the odds were. And so what happened there and the way that went down was, was really tragic because it could have been avoided. Uh, in, in a number of ways, but even if he'd waited, if he just, if, if he maybe thought about the lives of his men instead of just saying, hey, we've got this, doesn't matter what comes our way, we can handle it, maybe that could have been avoided. But it wasn't. And so that's, that's where I want to come today. If you look at Matthew 12, it may seem like a bit of a disconnect, but looking at the way that Custer handled, handled that, thinking about the lives of his men versus you know, hey, we've got this, you know, we've got some glory, that kind of thing, and, and pressing ahead even to the expense of his entire, you know, division here. Um, we find somewhat of a parallel, and I think we'll see that as we look at Matthew 12. Uh, before we continue, though, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for the word. I thank you for what it has to say to us. So, Lord, open our hearts, open our eyes to what it is you are telling us in this text, in your name. 
Amen. Uh, follow with me in your Bibles or, or your bulletins. Um, Matthew 12, beginning, beginning in verse 1. One time Jesus went to the Sabbath through some fields of grain. Now his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and eat. But the Pharisees, noticing, said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not permitted to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those with him, how he entered into the house of God and ate the bread of the offering which was not permitted for him, and those with him to eat, but only the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, yet they are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you'd already known what it means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would never have condemned the innocent. For the Lord of the Sabbath is the Son of Man. And he went from there into their synagogue, and look, a man with having withered hand. So they questioned him, saying, Is it permitted to heal on the Sabbath, in order that they might accuse him? But he said to them, What man of you might have one sheep, and if it should fall into a ditch on the Sabbath, would not grab it and lift it out? Therefore, how much better is a man than sheep, so that it is permitted to do good on the Sabbath? Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored whole like the other hand. But the Pharisees went out and made plans against him how they might destroy him. So this is our text. And, and in, in context here, uh, the end of chapter 11, interestingly, I'm going, to, I'm going to mention this now and then bring it to play a little bit later. But at the end of chapter 11, you find Jesus saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And those are familiar words to us. We've, we've heard that preached in many different situations. But just keep in mind that right before this happens, Jesus has just said to the crowds, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And now here you find turned around the Pharisees' yoke is anything but easy, and their burden is anything but light. So Jesus engages with the Pharisees on, on two occasions and for two reasons <coughs> to teach us about more than just the Sabbath. There's more going on than just that. But uh, so two cases here we're going to look at. So the first one is hunger versus Sabbath. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. And this account follows from 1 to 14 where it begins with one time. It's sort of like saying once upon a time. So you know this is where the story started. Jesus and his disciples are walking through a grain field. Now, this isn't this isn't all typical. Okay, this sort of thing happened. A lot of times, paths went through fields, so it's not like they're trespassing. They didn't break someone's fence to get here, um, and they weren't pilfering. When it says that they were plucking the heads of the grains and eating them, it sounds like oh, great. So you know, they're walking through the grocery store, you know, just grabbing the cookies off the shelf. It's not that. In fact, Deuteronomy 23, 24 through 25 says, if you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish, but you shall not put any in your bag. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hands, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So it's sort of like if you've ever gone, um, if you've ever gone strawberry picking or blueberry picking, there's places around here that, that do that sort of thing. And so you go through there and they say, you know, you put them in your basket and you know, you're allowed to pop one in your mouth, that's okay. Um, and that's basically what the law is saying here, except this would be more like like peanuts or sunflower, something you'd have to break up and, and before you eat it. Uh, that's what they were doing with this, with this grain. So the law permitted this, it just said no doggy bags, right? So you can go through, you can pick as many as you like, but don't start lining your pockets, okay? You're, the, the point was that you're, you're not trying to rip off this poor farmer, but if you're walking through there, it's perfectly fine to grab a couple and pop them in your mouth as a snack. So that's what's going on. Uh, what they were doing, there was absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's not what they did, but when they were doing it. So the Pharisees notice what's going on, and they intervene. In fact, the word, when it says that they noticed uh, the disciples, has more to do with the mental side of the equation than, than just what's going on with their eyes. Uh, they were looking for trouble and formed an opinion when they saw this. So it's not just they, they happened to notice them, but they, they looked at what they were doing, and they're going, aha! We got you now. Uh, it's, like no, it's like noticing somebody walking into a restaurant and thinking, oh man, here comes trouble. So it, it's not just looking at them, it's looking at them and sizing them up and being like, I know what's going on here. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. So they come to Jesus with their accusation in verse 2 and say, look at this. I mean, that's exactly what they say, look at that. Your disciples are doing what is not permitted on the Sabbath. And the disciples are right behind them. I mean, it's not like they're not there. It's sort of like... When someone's talking about you and you're right there and they're kind of talking over your head, it's like, no, I'm right here. Well, 
Well, this is what they're doing. They're telling Jesus, look at your disciples. What are they doing? They, they are breaking the Sabbath law. These stinky fishermen, rabbinical dropout, second-string Jews, are openly and blatantly breaking the Sabbath law. And they're thinking, we got you now. Your disciples have messed up. And it's, you know, by the way, this is serious. What they're accusing them of is serious. It's not just like, oh, you broke one of the playground rules. I mean, this, it was actually a capital offense. So in, in Jewish society, breaking the Sabbath was a capital offense punishable by death. So this isn't nothing that they are accusing the disciples of. And now we get to what they actually said. Your disciples are doing what is not permitted on the Sabbath. Some translations uh, translate this as lawful or right. Um, and this word is actually repeated four times throughout these two accounts, which is significant. I mean, if, if you look through it, uh, you can probably see in your translation because they usually keep the words the same, but it's over and over again. And, and that's not a mistake. That's not just coincidence. That is a theme that's going on. The Pharisees are all caught up with what is permitted, what is permissible, what's lawful or unlawful. Um, in fact, this, this word, you know, what it means to be permitted or, or lawful. Uh, a couple of examples outside of the Bible. It was used in a case of a man who was, who was vying for, for the office of city advisor, okay, but he didn't take the proper steps. So he wanted the position, but he didn't, he decided he didn't need to follow the protocol. And so he was making a move that was called not permissible, and thus he was demoted. So he didn't get this position, oh, but you can have that one down there because you know what? You're not going to follow the rules, you're not going to get the position. That's how it was used in one sense. Uh, in another sense, it was used in an apprenticeship contract where the father apprenticed his son out to a weaver. All right, so uh, whatever the weaver weaves, that's what he was going to weave. And so uh, he apprentices his son out, and in the contract it says the father is not permitted to take the son before the, the contract year is up. All right, so again, these are very kind of legal senses, which just, which just tells us how serious of a charge this is that they are making against the disciples, and how big of a deal they're making about this. See, the Pharisees didn't care about hunger. They didn't care that the disciples were hungry, that they'd been walking all day, or, or whatever the situation was. They only saw what they perceived to be a breaking of their rules. We're going to get to more of that later, um, what the big deal was. The fact is, is that nobody was breaking the law. The disciples were not breaking the law. Again, we just read in the law how this was a permitted thing to do, to go through, pick grain, and eat it. The question was, on the Sabbath, uh, again, the consequences of this were capital. I mean, they were looking at death if this was a real deal. So the Pharisees, see, here's the thing. The Pharisees took God's law, and they built fences around it. And this is, I mean, I think that's an actual phrase that comes out of some of the rabbinical teaching of that time. So they took God's law, and they said, okay, we really don't want anyone to break this law. So what we're going to do is we're going to, here's God's law right here. All right, you stay in here, this is God's law. Uh, specifically here, this is the Sabbath. All right, so God says, you don't work on the Sabbath, you don't do this on the Sabbath. Okay, there you go. But we don't want people to even get close to that. So we're going to expand that out here. And we're like, out here. And we're going to build this fence around it so no one can even get close to breaking that law. So here's what that fence looked like. Because there were some pretty extreme rules that they had. So on the Sabbath, you could not travel more than 3,000 feet from your home. It really stinks if, you know, the synagogues in Harrisonburg, you live in Newmarket, tough luck. But, but, however, you could previously deposit some belonging uh, a distance away from your home, which would extend that radius by another 3,000 feet. So imagine if everyone's doing that, right? I mean, imagine all the litter that you've got around. Guess what? Nobody's going to pick that up, not on the Sabbath. So you can imagine the litter problem you have from that. Uh, no bath on the Sabbath. If you happen to spill water on the floor, that was washing the floor. Go do that. Uh, no lifting over the weight of one dried fig. What if the fig's really big? Or what if it's small? I mean, uh, no looking in a mirror. If you saw a gray hair or something that was out of place and plucked it, then you were reaping. Watch out. No false teeth on the Sabbath. That was carrying over the weight limit. What if you have a hip replacement? I mean, then you just don't leave. You just sit. I don't know. Uh, no fire lit or extinguished. So if you failed to light your candle before Friday night rolled around and the Sabbath started, Guess it was early lights out. Uh, you could spit on a rock. 
I'm, I'm just reading it, okay? You could spit on a rock, that was fine. I mean, I guess they didn't have signs that said no spitting, but, but not on the dirt, because that's making mud. Making mud equals mortar, and that's work, because you know, you're making bricks now. So no spitting in the mud. If you got mud on your clothes, here's what you could do. You could crumple it once and shake it once. And if that didn't work, then I guess you're starting a new fashion trend. So these are just some of the, and then there were, there were some ridiculous laws, but these were some of the extra laws that were added to God's law with the idea that, oh, this is going to, you know, keep people from breaking God's law. What it actually did was put an incredible burden on people. I mean, could you imagine, really, could you imagine living under this? I mean, you start to dread the Sabbath, wouldn't you? You'd be like, oh man, I, oh man, I hope I don't break something I have no idea about. The intentions may have been good originally, but the results were disastrous and heavy. So Jesus responds to them with scripture, namely 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6. We won't read this. Uh, but first notice that Jesus answers them with a question. He does this both times. He answers them with a question. He says, have you not read? Which, which to them would have been a, a bit of a punch in the gut. All right, so, and he asks it two times. It, it's a bit of a sucker punch to their theology because uh, the word read means literally to know exactly. I mean, we understand this concept. Of it. A result of the written word is precision. Uh, you can misconstrue what you thought somebody said, but if it's in writing, you can't question what was meant. Uh, we understand this when it comes to contracts and legal matters. You know, you, you don't just go and sell a home or buy a home and, and shake, you know, spit in your hand, shake hands, and there we go, that's it, all right, done. No, you got contracts, you got legalities, because you want to make sure things are what was said, is what was meant, and you're going to hold to it. So, you know, we say it, give it to me in writing, in triplicate, something like that. So this would be a slap in the face because the Pharisees memorized most, if not all, of the Old Testament. And Jesus is questioning their understanding, not just their knowledge, when he says, wait, haven't you read? Well, of course they've read this, because the other sense of this word was public reading. So not just devotional reading. I mean, again, you're talking scrolls that were like as big as you are, so it's not like you sit on a cozy couch and you know, have your devotions out of the scroll. A lot of times these were read publicly in the synagogue. So, of course, these guys had it memorized. And they probably read it regularly in public. So of course they read it. What Jesus is saying is, you've read this, but you still don't get it. It obviously never sunk in. So, yeah, it's a bit of a punch in the gut. Much less Jesus cites the great King David, who they were all supposed to be experts in anyway. It's kind of like a trump card. So in this story that, that Jesus recounts, David meets the of the priest, asks for bread. I mean, they're, they're on the run. His, his men are on the run with him, and they're, they're hungry. They've been running all day. They're hiding. Um, and so they come to the priest, and they ask for bread. And so the priest says, yes, you know, all I've got is the, the bread of the offering here in, in, in the temple. So, you know, you can take that as long as you guys are pure. And so it, it worked out, and they, they took it, they ate, and, and went on. So Jesus recounts that technically it was not permitted, and Jesus used the, uses that word again. It was not permitted for David and his men to do that, only the priests. The priests were technically the only ones who were supposed to eat that bread. But in this case, something else happened. So the account of David uh, pulls no punches in portraying his moral failures. I mean, any other, any other story of David where he had a moral failure, whether it's Bathsheba or numbering the people or whatever, the Bible makes no bones about saying, this did not please the Lord. But you don't find that even hinted at in this account where he takes the bread. It's, it's portrayed in a positive light. In fact, the only punishment comes to the, pe the priests from King Saul later on, uh, which is then portrayed in a negative light. So what David did here, though, uh, was not portrayed in any such negative light. And they would have known this. So as Jesus is calling this to mind, they're, the puzzle is being put together quite finely for them. But before they can say anything, Jesus lays out another one on them. It's a, it's a bit of a one-two punch, right? Again, Jesus asks... Or have you not read, I mean, again, it's like, oh, man, he's, he's, you know, no mercy here, ouch. He says, or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, yet they are innocent? Uh, Numbers 28, 9 tells us that the priests are to offer, that means kill and burn, two male lambs, flour and oil. I mean, it sounds like a fried lamb recipe, like cooking. I mean, it would, it would certainly have that kind of smell. But at any rate, everything that would go into that process, it would have been a lot of work. 
and that's on the Sabbath. First Chronicles 9.32 says the priests make that the bread of the offering on the Sabbath day. And in uh, John 7, verses 22 and 23, Jesus says that it was a regular custom, uh, he recounts in a similar situation, how it's a regular custom for them to practice circumcision on the Sabbath. So all of these things are, are actually very work intensive. And Jesus is saying that, you know, you guys know that the priests regularly, technically desecrate the Sabbath. And yet, nobody questions whether or not they are innocent. Uh, this is a word that Jesus will use in, in the next couple of verses to describe his disciples. It means they didn't do anything wrong, whether we're talking legal or ceremonially or theologically. They should neither be blamed nor accused. They understood this about the priests. They did not see that about the disciples. And so Jesus points out that someone greater than any temple is here now. He means himself, the Messiah. And Jesus brings it home when he quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. Jesus says, but if you had already known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have never condemned, condemned the innocent. The full verse there says this, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And you can cite several verses throughout the Old Testament and say the same kind of thing. Uh, in Amos, he says, you know, he says, put away the noise of your feasts and your offerings and all of that. I don't, I don't want that, but let, uh, let justice flow like water. God was not looking for just rote ceremony, rote religious practice. He didn't care about that. That was all extra stuff. What he wanted was their heart. So when, when he had the practice, but not the heart, he said it made him sick. He didn't want that at all. And this is what Jesus is citing right here, because this is exactly what's going on. Um, he says, if you, had, if you had known this, you would not have condemned the innocent. And again, he's calling into question their understanding of the Old Testament. If you had not understood this one verse, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have never condemned these people. Uh, to know means understanding. It's not just sensory perception. He's not asking whether they understood the words. He's asking if they got it. It's not that they had low IQs. They just didn't understand what was right in front of them. The Messiah is right there. It's a classic if-then. If you had known this, then you would not condemn. With the idea that but you don't know this. You don't get this. And lastly, he says in verse 8, because the Son of Man, uh, the, the Lord of the Sabbath, is the Son of Man. Jesus is the Messiah. You know, this, this phrase is not used anywhere else except for Jesus. He basically coined this phrase, the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus' identity as the Messiah set him as the ultimate interpreter and fulfillment of Mosaic law and Sabbath. And so ends the, the first account, where the disciples are just hungry, they're doing something perfectly legal, the Pharisees jump on them, and Jesus calls them into question, not for anything else than their heart. And so we hope the story continues in case two, healing versus the Sabbath. And so the story moves on. It was the Sabbath, right? And they, were, and they were heading to the synagogue. I mean, they were going somewhere when they were going through that grain field. So onward they go. And as they go into the synagogue and begin uh, doing what they do there, reading, praying, and, and so on, a man enters with a withered hand. Now notice, he was not looking for healing. Did you notice that? This guy didn't come in seeking Jesus out so he could have his hand healed. He was just coming to the synagogue to worship on the Sabbath. I mean, he's just a normal guy. And he gets pulled into this. It was actually the Pharisees who singled him out. They see this guy and they're like, Oh, I got, I got an idea. Hey, hey, guys, come here, huddle. You know, they do the little huddle, and then off they go. So the Pharisees grab this guy, this poor guy, and use the handicapped man to uh, try to catch Jesus. Maybe they felt like Jesus showed them up at the grain field incident. Uh, now, his condition is interesting because the word describing literally means dry. So it's, it's hard to tell exactly what it meant, but um, I think it probably meant that his hand was paralyzed in some way. The word was used for that kind of condition. Maybe, you know, being paralyzed and stiff, it looked a bit like a, a dried stick or something like that. Maybe that's where the word came from. I'm not sure. His ailment was inconvenient, but in no way debilitating or life-threatening, like leprosy or blindness or some of the other things that we see Jesus heal. His one hand was paralyzed. And in fact, later on it says that his other hand was whole. All right, so one hand was fine. It was just the one hand was paralyzed. Not a big deal. Again, this guy was not seeking Jesus out saying, oh, please heal my hand. He was okay with, with going through life like this. It was the Pharisees that grabbed him and used him. 
So they ask, is it permitted, there's our word again, is it permitted to heal on the Sabbath? And here's this poor guy, probably looking like, what in the world is going on and why am I in the middle of this? They were looking to accuse Jesus, which means to betray, to make known, and declare. In a word, they wanted to expose Jesus for the fake and the blasphemer that they thought he was. So again, Jesus, in all of his wisdom, answers them with a question. And so he asks, What man of you might have one sheep, and if it should fall into a ditch on the Sabbath, would not grab it and lift it out? Now, unless you think this was some sort of random scenario, Deuteronomy 22.4 says, You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help them to lift them up again. So this wasn't a scenario that was, that was even unknown outside the law, much less in real life. And in a similar instance in Luke 14.5, Jesus says, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? The same point is made in regard to the Sabbath uh, law and rules. Life takes precedence over keeping the letter of the law in this instance. I mean, especially if your son was stuck in a well, you shouldn't be thinking about whether you are keeping every single rule. You're only thinking about saving that boy's life. I mean, imagine, um, you know, you guys have seen Lassie, right? So imagine Lassie barking at the door, and when Paul comes to answer it, he says, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, Timmy's stuck in, I know Timmy's stuck in the well, but you know, it's the Sabbath. Sorry, girl. And the door shuts. No, that wouldn't happen, right? I mean, and, and, and Jesus is saying, if, if it's your son, or for a livestock animal, or some, an ox in a well, that would really be an awkward thing. But, but if, if it was your son, your child, that fell into a well, you wouldn't care about what you were breaking or what was going on. You would be getting that poor boy out of that well, because life takes precedence. So Jesus drives the point home as though it shouldn't have been crystal clear already. And he says, therefore, how much better is a man than a sheep? And by man, we're talking life. So that it's permitted to do good on the Sabbath. I mean, it, it, should, be, it should be a no duh, right? And yet, they obviously didn't get it. Jesus is not challenging the Sabbath law, but their interpretation of it. Okay, Jesus isn't trying to disrupt everything that was going on with the Sabbath, because the law did talk about the Sabbath and, and what that meant and what it meant to keep it. And Jesus actually does nothing to undermine that. What he is undermining, what he is challenging, is the pharisaical interpretation of that law. All of the additional stuff they piled on top of it that, that crushed people. For the Pharisees, it was all about control over people. It wasn't about truth anymore. In fact, in Mark 2, 27, which is a, a parallel passage to this, Jesus says these famous words, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Again, something they obviously did not get. Keeping the Sabbath wasn't supposed to be hard. I mean, it wasn't supposed to be. The Sabbath was made for, for what? For rest. And yet, here it was completely 180 degrees. It was about resting, enjoying a meal together, and worshiping God. It was the Pharisees that made it so complex and so burdensome that it exhausted people. Again, I couldn't imagine what it would be like living under that. I mean, I look forward to go going to church, but if, you were, if every time you came to church, there was a set of rules that you had to follow a mile long, nobody would want to come. And yet there, for them, that was law. <coughs> so back to the handicapped man, it's, notice what Jesus does with him. He does heal him. But Jesus does not touch the man. He asks him to reach out his hand. He didn't ask the man to pick up a mat. He didn't spit and make mud. He didn't even touch the guy. Perhaps because all of those things could be misconstrued as work. He just speaks to the guy. And as the man reaches out, the ability to move comes back into his hand. And again, it says that his hand was restored so it was whole like the other hand. And so the man is whole. Again, he didn't come asking for this, but he left with that miracle having happened. So what? So so what does all of this mean for us? Okay? You know, for all. We, but we don't really we don't really deal with the Sabbath. I mean, some people look at Sunday as a Sabbath, but really we don't treat it like like the Sabbath. We don't obey Sabbath laws. So what does this mean to us? Well Jesus goes to bat for the disciples and for the handicapped man. 
To those suffering under the weight of the added burden the Pharisees enforced, it was liberation to focus on worshiping God instead of keeping all of these extra rules. The repetition of, of what is permitted or what is lawful is not a coincidence. It is the message that God wants us to see here. The truth is summed up in, in Hosea 6.6. 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God is looking for heart, not just ceremonial duty. And now, you know, I know where this goes. If we, if we start saying, don't be a Pharisee, that's like, in Christianese, you know, Christian language, in Christianese, that's like the ultimate slap in the face, you know. You're having a, like a child's name-calling thing, and you call someone a Pharisee, it's like, oh, watch out, the gloves are coming off, right? So don't call me a Pharisee. However, perhaps we're a little bit more like them than we care to think. The most important thing to the Pharisee was keeping every addition to the law they imposed. It was their opinion of perfection. So we've got to ask ourselves, what's really important to you? I mean, really. You know, and this isn't where we say it out loud so everyone knows that we got the right answer. This is where we answer it inside of our heart and we look at what really is going on inside of us. But what's really important? In other words, what do you really get worked up over? What is it that really gets you going? What motivates and drives you? Do you see the heart or do you get caught up in the stuff? You know, and I don't mean stuff like material things. It could even be ideals, programs, pet projects, or your own ideas, your own agenda. Sometimes it's so easy to get caught up in what you want to see happen, what I want to see happen, that we forget about the people that that impacts, negatively, specifically. The Pharisees got off track in what really mattered, and you know what, so can we. If we think that we're above that, then we're mistaken. Because we can look at them and, okay, yeah, they're, the clear, they're clearly the bad guys, you know, they're the ones wearing the black cowboy hat, yeah, we get that. But we're a, a lot more like them than we realize. And this is what God is trying to get across to us in this. It's not just so that we can dislike the Pharisees, but so that we can see ourselves in them just a little bit. I mean, all this stuff's important, just like the Sabbath was important. We're not saying stuff is not important, ideas or programs or, or the projects of the church. We're not saying that at all. But what comes first? When push comes to shove, what comes first? People or stuff? Because as, as humanity, you've got a pulse, then it's going to be a lot easier to put stuff in front of people. Especially when it's your own idea, when it's something you came up with. And, and you've nurtured, you've seen it grow, and then there comes a point where maybe the, that decision comes across. Maybe it's just an instance. Maybe it's not even as black and white as either the program fails or I do this. Maybe it's just one day, it's, well, we could have this meeting, but maybe something else came up. Someone's in the hospital, or, or someone needs you over here. So what wins? The stuff for the people. This is the question we have to ask ourselves. I had a pastor at one point uh, that I was working under, look at me and put his finger in my face and say, don't blame the program. This was coming at a point where uh, we were starting to head to Thailand and, and stuff was going on and we were kind of pulling out to transition. And I just remember that, the finger in my face saying, don't blame the program. And it became real evident to me at that point that what mattered to him was the stuff, his ideas and his agendas. And it didn't matter what people got trampled underfoot, as long as the program survived and went on, that's what mattered. So we have to ask ourselves this question, do our ministries serve people, or do people serve our ministries? And that's an honest question that we've got to answer. As we look at, at the service in our church, ministry exists here, and I'll cite Ephesians 4, ministry exists to equip us to go out, okay, not just to, not just to stay in here and become inward focused, but to go out. So do our ministries serve people, or do we just get people to serve our ministries? To, to whether, it's, whether it's filling positions, or whether it's, um, well, I've, I've got this, this project, but I need, more, I need more souls to pour into this project so, it can, so this can happen. And so are, do we have that project and that idea so we can reach out and reach more people? Or are we trying to reach people so we can feed our project? You see what I'm saying? And this was a mistake that the Pharisees were making, and this is a mistake that we can very easily make ourselves. I mean, yes, it's all about God, of course, of course, we understand that. But, after God, He is looking at people, life, and spiritual growth as of the utmost important. Let's take a minute and watch a video similar to the first one that we watched today, that talks a little bit about this.
This is missional community. Simple. Bob is the owner of the local hobby shop and president of the remote control airplane. Each Wednesday after work, the members of the airplane club get together to race, share in the joy of airplanes, compare designs, and to pass on the knowledge of model airplanes to their kids and grandkids. Bob goes to a church service with his sister on Christmas Eve and decides to become a Christian. He regularly attends Sunday services, finds his way into a small group, and joins the Wednesday night church gathering. He realizes that his commitment to church programs and his commitment to the airplane club are at odds. The church leadership empathizes with the situation to tell him it'd be better to attend the Wednesday program rather than spend time building airplanes. The church leadership also encourages Bob to get more involved in the church, leaving no time for airplanes. Bob agrees. Giving up a silly hobby would be his sacrifice for the Lord. Eventually, Bob's friends begin wondering what happened to him. In their minds, he was a critical part of the model airplane community. When they wander into his hobby shop, they ask, What happened to you? We miss you. Bob begins to realize that he's becoming an outsider to all the conversation, significant or otherwise, that always unfolded during their Wednesdays together. Bob explains that he found something more important than model airplanes, and he even offers an invitation to the Wednesday night church meeting. Some of the airplane club try out his church because they respect and love Bob. But a lot of them decide not to go because they value the time together with family and friends on Wednesday evenings. After some time, Bob becomes a key leader in the church and hears his call to go and reach those people he knew from the club. Since giving up the regular meeting with the club, his interaction feels more difficult than he'd imagined. After all, Bob, their leader, left them for what seemed to be just another club on Wednesday evenings. Somewhat troubled, Bob decides to take a break from Wednesday night church gatherings and re-enter the world of model airplanes. Some in the church were deeply concerned for Bob's spiritual well-being. Others were disgruntled. Then someone asked the question, what if we resource Bob to be even more effective at building healthy community where he already is? Let's help him to better live out more of Jesus' heart for compassion, generosity, peace, and love among people that know him best. After all, Bob is the most likely access point for those people to encounter Jesus. The church agrees. Bob's church is now determined to help him follow Jesus and assist him in living out his faith in the community that had been built around him. Bob now sees both his dedication to his church and to the model airplane community as critical components of following Jesus. So a little more food for thought. It's never an either or. Jesus wasn't asking the disciples or anyone else to choose between him and the Sabbath. It was never an either or. But do we get so caught up with what's going on at church that we stop being present in our presence in our own community? And a lot of times this can happen when we're bringing our own agendas and, and what we feel needs to happen. Community is both where you live and what you're involved in. In fact, do you know, in the, we all understand the Great Commission, we've all heard it many times, but do you know what the actual command is in the Great Commission? It's, it's actually not go. It's make disciples. That's what we're commanded to do. The go part is, is kind of an incidental thing. It's like, as you are going, make disciples. Wherever you go, make disciples. Whether it's here, there, when you're at your job, it's like the way that, uh, that the law prescribed ch child rearing in Deuteronomy. It says when you, when you stand up, when you sit down, when you go out, when you come in, that's when you are teaching. And that's when we're making disciples. Wherever we go, whatever we're involved in, wherever God has us, whatever our community is. So where do you put up the roadblocks and say no? For the Pharisees, it was here. It was the sabbatical law. For us, it might be something. For each of us, it might be something different. Jesus was confronting their understanding and their stubbornness. Can we be like that? And we have that same kind of stubbornness, especially when it's something that we care deeply about, that we feel strongly about. Do we have our own agenda, pet ideas that we refuse to let go of, even if, if we're really willing to run people over to adhere to it? The Pharisees were so concerned over what was lawful and permitted on the Sabbath, but they didn't get what the right thing was, and that was to put people before ceremony. It's like they stopped rescuing people so they could upgrade their lifeboat and make that thing shine. Remember, Jesus had just told people that his burden was easy and light, and that he offered rest. So here it is. Prefer people to protocol. Put relationships before rules. We're not saying break rules or, or forget organization or forget anything like that. Again, Jesus was never saying this was an but when it comes down to it, what matters most? Do people matter the most? 
Does life matter the most? Does spiritual growth and, and spiritual enhancement matter the most? Or do our own ideas and agendas and thoughts ever get in the way of that happening? God wants us to put our relationships with people before a simple adherence to protocol. Sometimes the right thing to do is to break the rules when spiritual things are at stake. As our worship team prepares today, I uh, just want you to, to think this over and, and see where you stand. And this is, it's not an easy question to answer. You know, we, we all have our reasons for what we do. We all have our reasons for why something is, is so important to us. But we have to, we have to consider <coughs> when it comes down to it, and it will. Because at some point, our, our perfect little plan is going to get messed up. You know, somebody's going to have a crisis. Something's going to go wrong. And so what happens when, when that happens? What do we do when that happens? When something interrupts our perfect plan, do we freak out at the person? Or do we reach out to them and put our plans, our agendas aside? When something goes wrong, maybe, maybe we, we've planned something and it's going great, and then somebody makes a mistake. Do we jump down their throat and say, how could you do that? Or do we understand that, you know what, we all make mistakes, and do we give them grace? Now, I'll tell you, um, I appreciate our guys that work back in the sound booth, because I feel like they're, they're really the definition of a servant. You want to know why? Because nobody notices what they do until something goes wrong, right? And I can remember at one point when I was in college, we had a speaker, and he was speaking, he's preaching from the Word, and blah, blah, blah. And then something went wrong with the sound booth, and he looked back there, and he just like ripped into them. And I remember sitting there thinking, "How can you do that? How can you act? How can you be preaching the word and then rip into somebody who's just served?" And this is what we're talking about. So look, look in your own heart and see, frankly, where where are you a little more like the Pharisees than than you'd like to think? Now I can fall into that. I, I can get ideas in my head, and oh, we got it. Got to do this. Got to be this way. And you know what? Things don't always go the way that we want. And sometimes, like a lot of times, that's God working. So it's not just putting people in front of our ideas, but, but even God. Because God uses everyone. God uses more people than just you or me 